As Jason just said, I want to, well, I just want to thank Jason and Jesse um, for bringing me here in the Simpson Center and you all for coming out on the last week of classes, right? This is probably a tiring time for you and the last thing you want to do is sit in this room, so I'll hope, hopefully make it kind of fun a little bit, maybe. Um, so I wanted to let you know that this project is really in its infancy. I just started thinking about this and um, the story that got it going is actually um, to tag off of what Jason was saying is that I was at, um, I don't know if anyone in this room was at the Environmental Humanities and the Anthropocene Symposium at University of Utah a couple of years ago. I know there were a couple of UW people there, so I was thinking maybe some people would show up. Um, anyway, they were great, it was fun. Um, but we were, I was show, I had showed up, I had just had, I was, I was uh, like 17 months into having had a second kid and I was at a teaching institution, Humboldt State is a teaching institution. I just started there about a year before, and uh, it was it was a, a, a leadership program for the program of the BA for environmental studies. And at Humboldt State, there are a lot of science folks in the College of Natural Resources and Sciences, but nobody had thought about having a humanist come and do an environmental studies, environmental humanities approach to environmental studies. And so I'm pretty sure I might have been the only humanist who applied for my job. Um, sweet, got the job. Um, but they had advertised it in kind of all the wrong places, but when you're an environmental humanist, you kind of know this, right? So you know where to dig and you, get, you know everyone's gonna kind of use you for a scientist and you can kind of like do the Trojan horse thing and get in the humanities in that way. Um, which of course, this issue translates to this topic because students wonder what the heck they're gonna do with a humanities or social science or arts degree that has to do with the environment when everyone keeps thinking that they have science skills. Um, anyway, so that's, I'll get to that. Um, but anyway, so I, had, I was at this teaching institution, I was taking on this program leadership, and I was feeling really bogged down in um, students' existential crises around these issues. And them, every, you know, kind of, I could get to the, I was getting to the point where I could predict their affective stage of where they were. Like, okay, we're at loss of innocence now. It's like the building's Roman, the Anthropocene building's Roman, or something, right? So it's like, oh, where are we now? Oh, we're at apathy. Oh, you, you stopped coming to class for a while? I know where we're at. That's because we just read, you know, whatever. Um, so it started to be kind of like a, um, a trend. I could see a trend, and it was really sapping my own energies because I felt I was brand new to this program. I had bent my will on getting this job. It was my dream job. And uh, I was so excited that they were excited to have a human and I had a lot to prove that we had something to offer. And um, I felt like the students' existential crises were my job to fix because we, that was going to be the evidence of success of the program. That's a lot of pressure to put on yourself. So I was kind of dying under this and I was, I was like bogged down in all the stuff that's like about, you know, program leadership, like assessment and program reviews and all that kind of junk. And I was feeling like I didn't have any time for research, you know, like the stuff that you guys get to do at UW and, and people at Oregon were doing when I was there. And then I was at this symposium at Utah and everybody was so smart and brilliant and producing all this amazing stuff and doing research. And Jen Ladino, who was um, just about to edit and was about to put out her call for affective eco-criticisms, was sitting at the picnic table with me and I was like, Jen, I don't have a research life anymore. It's been sucked up by these students' crises and I'm, I'm just like, I got the tissue box and I got the chocolate and it's like the line out the door and it's like killing me. So um, I was feeling really sorry for myself, which was not a very, it was kind of an ugly moment for me, I have to say, it was not a good practice and gratitude. Um, but, sh but I was feeling, have, having imposter syndrome at the moment, you know, and that's what happens when you kind of get there and you're like, oh my God, what am I doing here? And she said, well, it sounds like you are, um, that you have a, a path that your students go through that's kind of almost kind of a predictable path. And she called it an affective arc. And she said, it sounds like you have an affective arc. She was starting to get really into affect theory and she was doing a lot of work on affect theory. And I had never thought about affect theory. I mean, I, I talk about environmentalist disgust in um, the ecological other. So that's, she says, you do this in the ecological other, you do affect. And I said, well, I, don't, I don't know what that is. And she said, um, why don't you make, studying this affective arc of your students in, your, in the program, since you have the, the privilege of this perspective over the whole curriculum, and, you, and I actually get to like tweak it, you know? It's like so much interesting view, right? Um, why don't you make that affective arc your research? And I thought, oh, that would be efficient, and it would also maybe solve some of my problems. And um, it would make me feel like I had a research project and I, I had just never thought about it before. And it was just such a, like an aha moment. And I really credit her for getting me to completely shift my gears because I had had, I was doing all this kind of environmental justice, cultural studies stuff. And I just, it was sort of dead in the water. And I was, I was really thinking all the time about solving my students' existential crises. So she said, turn that into a research project. And so that's where this comes from. Um, and so 
Um, one of the things that comes out of it, though, that I still puzzle over, and I really it would be excited to hear your feedback about, is that, of course, part of the problem is the universalizing move that Jason just mentioned, that um, there isn't just one affective trajectory, and everything has to do with how students come into the class, where they're going to go from there. So one student's going to have a loss of innocence experience because they may have never have experienced some of these things or have thought about some of these things. Another student is going to be very furious about that. Um, I call it eco-white fragility in the classroom, right? Like there's a majority of my students who are going through this are white, and they haven't ever experienced or thought about these things before. And so the, the white fragility of their existential angst kind of takes all the oxygen in the room, and I'm, I'm, I battle with that. I really struggle with that. Um, and so I talk a little bit about that in my talk, too. I just want to give you a little context and um, take up a, little, a few of the things that Jason um, said and give you the story of how this began. And I was telling Jason earlier that I really feel strongly about this stuff, but I, yesterday at Evergreen, I was hearing all kinds of really good arguments for not centering affect in the classroom, and I thought, those are really good arguments, too. I'm perfectly happy to let you not do it, you know? <laughs> so for, for faculty who really struggle with this, and I think for students who struggle with this, it's nice, it's helpful to know that there are ways and strategies to, to uh, address it. And I hope I make the case that it's actually less care work and, and instead of more care work, and I think that's part of the um, intersectional analysis I'm trying to bring to thinking about this too. Okay, so that's sort of an introduction. Okay, so ever since that faded chat on the picnic bench with Jen, um, I have been, I've, she, she convinced me to publish this, I have a, a, um, a version of this in Affective Ecocriticisms coming out. And I've shared this research in a number of settings. Um, the main place was that the CSU UC system has recently gotten together a big collaboration, a network of folks doing climate education and really wanting this, this kind, these kinds of tools. And so I'm really excited to be in this statewide network of people sharing these, these tools too. So um, people are really thinking about centering rather than being annoyed by students' existential angst in the class. If you ask students how it feels to come of age in the Anthropocene, what kinds of words do you hear? Despair, nihilism, grief, heartbreak, loneliness, impotence, apathy, anxiety, depression, guilt, shame. And this is all going on with a background of increase of anxiety and depression in, in college students and all kinds of other mental health issues and experiences of trauma, interge intergenerational trauma, sexualized violence, et cetera, that is becoming increasingly part of the um, emotional terrain that we're operating with. But then if you ask students to visualize thriving in the Anthropocene, <laughs> what would it take? What would that look like? Try doing this with your students and it will be very painful. They can't do it, and it's really sad. Um, and I did an exercise, a visualizing of the future exercise using Adrienne Marie Brown's book, which I'll talk about later, um, Emergent Strategy, where she asked that question, what does it look like to thrive in a climate change future? And um, the students had every single reason they possibly could come up with for not, ex not entertaining this exercise. But do any of us imagine desiring life in a climate change future? It's no wonder our st students can't imagine or desire their futures. How can we expect them to work hard in college, even get up in the morning, when they have no answer to this question? What are they working for? We all have these deflating experiences fumbling through our students' loss of innocence in our classes. Um, this is really challenging because, frankly, I don't know what the future holds, and I'm pretty freaked out. And I hope that the research that I'm going to share with you today helps me and other students and faculty and maybe even indirectly nature in to thrive in a climate change future. Um, a recent video, does anybody recognize this, this screenshot of a recent video? Jason did? Okay. Um, recent video circulated on Facebook, and this is just one shot of the video, um, showing a boy about eight or nine years old weeping hysterically because he's become aware that animals are dying, air is polluted. I'm smiling, it's not funny, I'm sorry. People are, but it was kind of, it was sort of cute and sweet, and I was kind of laughing, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, it's just I'm so used to it, I've become a nerd so I can laugh, but it's very, it is heartbreaking. Um, people are throwing trash on the ground, he says. Um, he says, people are turning forests into places. I thought that was interesting. Um, and destroying the planet. I run a, um, at, at Humboldt State, because I run this program, I'm trying to constantly create community. I run a, a Facebook page for Humboldt State, um, and I want to let you know, an acronym I'm going to use a lot is ENST, which is the, per, the acronym for the program that I run there. On the ENST Facebook page that I manage for the program, students posted comments commiserating with the boy and even blaming my classes for their own similar meltdowns. 
I, have you had this in your classes, right? You're like, oh, shit. Um, I often feel like a parent whose job it is to facilitate their awakening to a world whose grim future stands in stark contrast to their innocent pre-college idealism. Other times I think that the NST degree is some kind of 12-step program, or maybe Joseph Campbell's hero's journey with his own arc of affects, moving in stages from idealism to lost innocence, shame, denial, grief, nihilism, apathy, optimism, and then maybe some kind of hope or efficacy to work against planetary and personal defeat. <coughs> At the same time, I feel guilty about the world I'm passing on, and I worry about my own similar um, emotional journey. On a bad day, I wonder, following um, that famous Atlantic um, article, The Coddling of the American Mind, and the overparenting books, and uh, there's all kinds of um, theories out there about the millennials and how delicate they are. Um, I wonder if millennials are so privileged or sheltered or delicate that they can't take the ugly realities of environmental crisis and social injustice. Or maybe it's just really cool to have a lot of angst, you know, like it used to be when I was younger, you know, smoking cigarettes and looking really depressed. Were they overparented or maybe underparented? Maybe they don't have grit. I don't know. I don't agree with any of those things, actually. I really spent a lot of time battling against those kinds of arguments about the millennials. But on a bad day, I sometimes feel like, ah, what's going on? Um, but whatever it is, their, their despair from the class and also from everything else in their lives inhibits their ability to learn, much less become these engaged citizens and leaders that we promise in our promotional materials. In what follows, I want to make the case that addressing the affective arc of environmental studies and science curricula, and I'm going to call that ESS, is crucial for liberatory pedagogy and for climate justice. This project is part proposal for ESS curricula, part strategy to save the planet through pedagogy, and just as important, part guide to how to save myself from students' perfectly reasonable demand for assurance and tools to engage the Anthropocene. It's not a study of mental health among college students, and classes are not group therapy. Like my favorite pedagogy scholar, Bell Hooks, I would agree that teachers are not therapists. We should direct students to experts when they're in crisis, and as a recent Chronicle of Higher Ed article by Catherine Savini argued, there is much we can do to attend to students' emotional lives in the classroom without positioning ourselves as their therapists or their saviors, which is really what I thought I was supposed to be doing. And, and so this research comes out of this desire to hold back that, but still not deny them some tools. I've become convinced that it's important to take students' emotions into account as part of curriculum design. But I also feel the need to draw boundaries to protect myself as a person, but also as a female who has her own scholarly and non-academic commitments. I know that processing my students' existential crises both inspires and depletes me, and that female faculty are disproportionately sought by students for this kind of emotional care. Moreover, cultural taxation places female faculty of color in even more demand as higher education diversifies. But I want to propose that attending to the affective experiences of students in the curriculum can reduce that extracurricular labor, cultivate resilience in students, protect faculty from burnout, and because it equips students for the marathon of a lifetime of work, that's to use Robert Bullard's word, contribute possibly to planetary salvation. I hope. You can only hope for that. Um, okay, so taking emotion seriously means acknowledging that the material will make students feel things, and that we can choose material to get them to feel things that will enable outcomes we hope for them, right? Um, it also means changing those outcomes a bit. So I started to rethink about, rethink what the actual student learning outcomes are for my classes, much less for the program. Um, they used to be these really like practical, deliverable things, and now they feel like emotional outcomes that are impossible to measure. And so I'm sure when I get it, you have to do assessment, you know, it doesn't really work, right? But uh, we still work, we work against those things all the time. Um, it also means changing the outcomes and possibly some of the assignments that will help them achieve those outcomes. So I'm, I'm exploring all kinds of assignments that are in different fields, like in communication, I'm using an ethical listening assignment. I never did anything in communication before. Um, I'm doing all kinds of assignments and readings and things that are in other fields, psychology, eco-psychology, which I used to always poo-poo and all this other stuff. And I'm like, oh, I guess these are tools I'm going to need. Um, it means helping them develop a community of their cohort so they can rely more on each other and less on you as their instructor. And these things turn out to be very good hip pedagogy or high impact practices. 
Um, scholarship on educational psychology shows us, as Douglas Robertson says, quote, emotion plays a central part in so many aspects of the teaching and learning system. And effective teachers and advisors need to be aware of their own and their, their students' emotional lives. All of my classes travel an intensely affective arc, even when I try to avoid it, which I, I don't know how to do that. Students feel about the material sometimes in ways that overcomes our time together. Trying to limit this by maintaining a strict reason-emotion dichotomy has not worked for me. Affect theorists Sarah Ahmed and Teresa, uh, Teresa Brennan would argue that anguish in response to our course material actually belongs in the classroom, as uncomfortable as it is and as untrained as we might feel to deal with it. In my case, I started to realize that if I didn't deal with it in the classroom, I would be dealing with it outside the classroom on an individual basis with all these students coming in and closing the door and having their meltdown and then the next line out the door at the next one and it was like oh, not open for business, right? Um, it, I wanted to do that for them but it seemed like if we could do it collectively that would be more efficient <laughs> for me too. And then I started also to think that um, their, their deep engagement with the material may be a sign of success, right? Um, and I started to think um, about the ways that um, negative emotions were actually quite generative. Um, I started to think about how to become more comfortable with my own negative feelings to their responses. And I started to see my task as an instructor not to fix their negative feelings, make them happy, like you, you know, American, American culture tells us that's what we're supposed to do, but rather to politicize and direct those emotions in ways that give them a sense that they have some potential to improve the problems that they see. Environmental sociologist Kari Norgaard's book, I don't know if you're familiar with this, has anybody seen this? She's, she's a UVO too, bring her down, bring her on down. Um, Living in Denial, Climate Change, Emotions, and Everyday Life has been really helpful for me. She notes that emotion is central to public life and social movements. Emotions are, quote, tied to the moral values that shape social movement goals, provide motivation for potential participants, and form the basis of solidarity among movement participants. Making affect a focus of our work together helps students connect their inner lives to the broader context of politics and its possibilities. In what follows, I trace the affective arc of ENST, explore how issues of power and justice help us navigate that arc, and scrutinize the value of the affect of hope as a means of addressing students and our own emotional experiences with this material. Scholarship about affective responses to ESS programs is limited. It focuses on whether students become more aware of environmental problems or engage in more pro-environmental behavior. And frankly, I don't particularly care about that question. Um, that's awesome for those people. That's not what I'm interested in. While the dominant literature about affective responses to climate change focuses on the emotions of those affected by climate change. So I'm drawing here on my own experience teaching undergrads and designing this nascent BA program to try to fill gaps in this literature, focusing on the specific nature of ENST-related anguish and offering some insights about how to address it. ENST, ma ENST majors have already drunk the dying polar bears eco-apocalypse Kool-Aid. So they don't need to be assessed about whether they've been converted to caring about the environment. <coughs> And my students are relatively privileged uh, in that they attend a North American college and are generally sheltered from the everyday disasters of climate change, although the fires in California are raising some questions about that. Scholarship on teaching sustainability and on disaster mental health does not really help with the questions that I have. So I have been really looking at resources in affect, um, environmental affect, um, like these texts here, just for example, um, eco-psychology, this has been a really great, really helpful text for me, Emotional Resilience in the Era of Climate Change. I never thought I would want to read a book like that, um, but here I am. Social movement studies, again, uh, you know, um, Diane Millian's got a, a wonderful theory called felt theory, uh, where she talks about um, emotions and stories as a form of indigenous epistemology or knowledge production, and that's really been an uh, interesting, really helpful tool for my students to think about. And this book is like the senior capstone book, like pick 10 of these essays and feel better. <laughs> um, that's really, some, again, a book I never would have picked up. And um, a lot of uh, pedagogy, cri critical or liberatory pedagogy, um, these are the kinds of books that uh, I really feel like are really focusing on questions of affect and emotion in ways that the environmental sustainable um, pedagogy literature is missing in general. Okay. 
So um, ENSC students come to college idealistic and optimistic, but become depressed or despairing when they learn how difficult and entrenched our environmental crises are. Then they're asked to do things like the ecological footprint exercise. You know what that, you know what that is? Yeah, that's, that's terrible exercise. Don't make your students do that. That's <laughs> awful. And they become disgusted with themselves and the rest of their fellow Americans, and they internalize these eco mantras like leave no impact, or how about save the planet, kill yourself. And this is kind of funny, but um, I, it never dawned on me that how many students that I have coming through, and I mentioned this in the talk yesterday at Evergreen, and several students came up to me afterwards to say that was an experience they had. They never thought about it that way. That um, people had basically stopped eating because they don't know how to eat and consume sustainably, and so it connects with their sense of um, body image issues and um, sort of a nihilism that manifests in the form of eating disorders. Many are seduced in a, into a kind of self-erasing, misanthropic eco-nihilism. They're further depressed by the stories and analyses they encounter daily in their courses. And environmental grief emerges. Faced with the enormity of Earth's devastation, students are given few tools to address that mourning in the classroom. Many faculty consider their jobs done when they have convinced students that the problems exist and are not just Chinese hoaxes. I fear if we stop there, should, the students will check out and go want to live in a cave somewhere, which they're always on the brink of doing in my classes. I'm like, hey, are you going to surfing today or are you coming to class? What's going to be? <laughs> um, I mean, you know, it's Arcata. There's, there's other things to be doing than being in class. Let's just put it that way. Um, rather than engaging in the political and cultural work, cultural work that, frankly, I really want them to do. Who would blame them? After all, their individual efforts can't possibly address these challenges, and existing institutions and systems, including the classroom, seem unlikely to act in anything but um, the interests of short-term interests of capital's growth. They think that they're going to college to learn how to save the world. I mean, that is literally, they, they, it's, like a, it's like a test before they walk in the door. Are you here to save the world? Okay, you're allowed. Um, it's, it's a Humboldt State kind of a thing. Um, but instead, they're asked to deconstruct cherished beliefs in their own moral righteousness. Okay, we're going to list some of these. There's lots of cherished beliefs that get thrown out the door right away. In the capacity of science and technology to solve all their problems, in the belief that nature can be saved, and in their very concepts of nature itself, we challenge their beliefs in positivism and objective truth and in the nature of knowledge. For many, the material challenges their own white savior industrial complex. As they learn more about the seriousness of the climate change crisis, students gain new insights. They are complicit in the crisis. Their moral and political energies are misguided and maybe even oppressive. Environmental problems are too entrenched, too structural and complicated to be addressed merely by making green lifestyle choices. And the existing sustainability experts may not have all the answers. Oh, that's heavy stuff. In addition, they learn that wilderness and nature are socially constructed. And this realization undermines their notion of what nature is, it undermines their love of being in nature, and their whole premise for being in humble state, which of course have sold them this beautiful environment to come and study in, and dissolves their fantasies of protecting it. I'm putting that in quote marks, protecting it, right? <laughs> Stacey Alema observes that those who pursue ESS precisely to avoid self-reflection, politics, discomfort, analysis, and complexity, because that's what, of course, um, a lot of, I, that always surprises me as students come to environmental studies because <coughs> they love nature, and nature is a place where ostensibly you don't have to think, right? Um, that they're trying, to, um, they're trying to avoid thinking critically about their own positionality and about their views of nature. For them, nature may seem a tamer topic than politics or so sociology, since they see it as, Alemo says, a refuge from the political morass of identity politics. Deconstructing, I love this picture, it's like, those are my students right there. So that's like, classic. Um, students often seek ESS as an escape from the uncomfortably agonistic and political world, she says, and prefer the solace of exaltation. Nature is so firmly articulated to notions of the transcendent, Alemo says, the sublime, the enlightening, that it has become, well, natural to exalt it rather than to examine it. So they think that ESS is, ENST is going to be a safe, feel-good, easy major. And you can bet they're upset when they learn that addressing environmental problems will require uncomfortable self-reflection, 
not just learning how to argue their positions better. That's what I think they come into environmental studies for, to learn how to communicate the problem better and persuade more people. And that is, that turns out, if that's your interest, what we're doing feels um, like not what they bargained for. These insights shake their epistemological foundations and emotional armor, and they feel like they no longer can escape to nature to detox from those impure ideas they're learning in the classroom anyway. What are they even doing in an ENST if these pleasures are robbed of them? Without curricula, it tends to affect, like pleasure, right? Students are likely to leave college not as the well-trained, problem-solving leaders that we promise on our websites, but deflated and aimless and angry. And it, the worst part is that, that they're going to be mad at me for that, right? So I, I take it all personally, and maybe you do too. Students report to me that their downward spiral begins on the first day of the required lower division course, Power, Privilege, and the Environment. The assignment that day is to complete an environmental privilege nap knapsack questionnaire. Have any of you ever completed the white privilege knapsack or taught that exercise? One person. Okay, so you're some, sort of familiar about what it is. It's a list of statements that you would say yes or no to, and it kind of reveals you know, your relative white privilege. But on Pachamama.org, there's a really useful, although needing to be updated, race and class privilege in the environmental movement um, knapsack exercise that you can get and use and check out. And I recommend it. It's quite an exercise. And we do it on day one, and it's kind of like the wool is pulled from everyone's eyes. Drawing on Peggy McIntosh's white privilege knapsack, this exercise exposes privilege's underlying dominant environmental beliefs. Students are asked to answer yes or no statements to things like, my sense of intimacy with the land does not entail spending a hot day in the sun, picking strawberries, or tending someone else's lawn. And so just to give you an example, I'm not expecting you to read all these. It's too much text for a slide. But I pulled like, I don't know how many, 15 of these statements off of, there's about 50 on the exercise. And so if just while you're listening, you probably can read at the same time a little bit of these just for fun. Um, this one, the universalizing move, like the Anthropocene one that Jason was just mentioning, um, I particularly like, I can choose to blame the whole human species for the ecological crisis rather than looking at how my own lifestyle depends not only on ecological destructed, destruction but other kinds of violence and exploitation. I mean, it's, it's, some of these get really harsh, you know, and the students are like, Ugh. and they come in and they're mad. They're really mad at me for making them do this, and they, they feel guilt. And they're mad that they feel guilt. And I'm like, OK, here are all the great articles you can read on guilt. And let's go there next, right? So you have to kind of, um, it's, it's frustrating, and I don't want them to feel guilt. I think guilt is a very conservative, unuseful place to go, but it is the place that most of them go. <clears throat> most of my students are non-native and are appalled when they realize that their love of national parks, for example, is shaped by a privilege that makes it possible for them to be just unaware of the history of genocide in these landscapes. And that was my case, too. I was never taught that until uh, college. These students reel from becoming aware of their myriad cognitive dissonances and struggle to reconcile their love of nature with their ostensibly progressive social ideals. And so that's one place we go. Can you be critical of something and love something at the same time? And that is an affective conflict, right? It's a, a mo reason emotion thing happening. My students are stunned about how hard this work is. They thought they were leaving the sciences to come and do easy stuff, right? And I'm really quite shocked that they expected anything different. In contrast, students who respond no to many of these statements are often already politicized about social injustice. Such students constitute the minority of ENST majors right now, although those demographics are changing. And so this exercise is starting to have the effect of actually centering whiteness in my classroom, and I'm starting to rethink using it. Um, I haven't given up entirely yet, but it's on my mind. Um, many non-white students, first, uh, first generation or working class students, which we have many um, at HSU, are already engaged in liberation struggles, and they report positive affects in many of these classes, in part because we try to center their experiences. Um, different students will undergo different affective journeys with this material. This is what I was hinting at earlier. And I think it's pay, very important to pay attention to these different um, journeys and not just assume one arc. We all learn, though, that non-mainstream environmental attitudes can be valid and that there is more than one way to be an environmentalist. This knocks some students off of their high horses of righteousness, which is awesome, but the exercise and humility in the lab of the classroom actually builds community. 
And understanding the ladder of white privilege helps us work through some of the issues that come up after that exercise. Awareness of liberatory pedagogy principles, principles is key to addressing some students' newfound awareness of privilege while preventing it from consuming all of the oxygen in the room. The end goal for all students is to connect their positionalities to their environmental beliefs and politics, whatever that might look like. Because it's hard to watch students delve into despair, I think many ESS instructors turn to ending on hope. And I would caution against this. I'm starting to see how this may in fact be a shallow approach to thinking about emotional engagement with the material and fails to equip students with a lifetime of successes and failures. Also, I feel like wanting to end on hope says more about my own discomfort with their feelings than it is about the actual skills that they need to deal with what I'm telling them about the world. Um, as Norgard puts it, it's a struggle to balance our own personal doubts and deep feelings of powerlessness with the task of sending a hopeful message to our students. So there's this sort of tension or hypocrisy there that I think ending on hope doesn't adequately deal with. It's just a, the easy way out, I'm sorry to say. I, I'd be interested to hear thoughts about that. Anguish, discomfort, shame, and guilt, and apathy can all be productive affects for decolonizing environmental studies. And we miss the opportunity if we default to a kind of uncritical hope that pedagogy expert Jeff Andrade Duncan calls hokey hope, or Lauren Berlant um, calls cruel optimism. In another Chronicle essay, The Educational Power of Discomfort, and of course you remember all these discussions around safe spaces, um, so I'm, 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 I had drew, drew some of my um, research from that discussion. Irina Popescu argues that we should not shelter our students from failure and suffering or avoid content that would make our students feel uncomfortable or unsettled. She writes, history is unsettling. The present is unsettling. There should be more being said about the power of discomfort. When students who are unaware of the scope of historical injustice realize that depressing things have been happening for a long time, they are less shocked by our current and future crises. An uncritical pursuit of happiness can gloss over historical injustice and prohibit resilience. Sarah Ahmed rejects the notion that, quote, bad feelings are backward and conservative and good feelings are forward and progressive. An assumption that she says allows historical forms of injustice to disappear from our memories. Students never imagine that seeking happiness might actually ironically get in the way of their well-being and rarely question whether it's effective for the long-term work of social change. Discomfort is not inconsistent with meaningful hope. ESS scholar Michael Ma uh, Maniates thinks that, the, that ESS programs in particular, quote, fail to acclimate students to contentious environments and therefore do not prepare them to navigate what he calls the turbulence of working among conflicting stakeholders, communicating across interests and backgrounds, and challenging dominant thinking. Exploring students' negative affects also helps them resist the brainwashing effects of green capitalism, which has convinced them that their individual actions will save the planet. In class, for example, we read Derek Jensen's polemical Forget Shorter Showers, sort of a classic, maybe you guys read I mean, I, I don't know, I'm ambivalent about still teaching it, but it's, it's useful. Um, which shows students that personal change is not the same as social change. Maniates helps us think that, um, helps us to see that the easy ways to save the planet narrative tells us that all we need to do is buy green, initiate a few lifestyle changes, spread the word, and wait for the totality of these small changes to sum into fundamental social change. And I don't know about you guys, but that's, that's sort of what the, my students think, right? And they're looking at me and they're like, why aren't, why aren't you riding your bike? What's wrong with you? You must not be right. Something's not right with you. I can't take you seriously. I have chickens though, right? So that kind of makes up. Um, these green consumer approaches are individualistic and they dis distract us from thinking about collective identities, what Manny Ace calls networks of obligation to which we belong. Individuals cannot solve climate change on their own, but they often see other forms of civic engagement as too diffuse. They need to think more broadly about how social change works. And so that's one of the reasons why all of a sudden I'm researching social, how does social change work? I don't know. I never knew that answer, so I, now I'm thinking a lot about that. Getting uncomfortable shows students the limits of individualism. As Janet Fiskio explains, it's difficult to get students in ESS courses to articulate collective responses outside of a market economy. <laughs> and I don't know about you guys, but I can't either. I have a hard time figuring out what, what to do that's not part of a market economy. Because the doctrine of human selfishness and the privatization of public life have subjugated our minds and desires. 
Once students realize that reduce, recycle, reuse as a form of neoliberal individualist consumer behavior, they struggle to think of collective non-consumer actions they can take to confront climate change. Dwelling in negative affects plugs students into networks of obligation. And so Fiskew concludes that on an affective level, what this means is that I hold students in the presence of the unbearable grief of climate, climate change. Grappling with affect helps students get out of, out of the urgency plus inability trap, which is something that Maniatis critiques, that many ESS classes leave students with this ur urgency plus in inability thing. And that's no good. That's not helping us. Um, and and uh, Janet uh, Fiske also then says that um, it helps us get away from the quote, cliched dichotomy of hope despair that dominates the usual discussions of climate change. So we want our students to be hopeful and empowered, but not for the wrong reasons. We want them to dwell in the grief, but not too much, discomfort about their own privileges, and a more complex understanding of their role in environmental issues can inspire students to desire more social change. When ESS courses accept such discussions and link environmental issues to privilege, white students' shame and defensiveness can be transformed in, into solidarity. So students report in evaluations that course material is so depressing and ask that we give them more solutions. Does anybody get that in your, yeah. <laughs> would that we could. If we had known what to do, we would have done it already. Giving students what they ask for, more hope and more prescriptive solutions may temporarily boost their mood, but it is dishonest and it will not enable them to sustain the work that actually needs to be done. I worry that en enlisting ESS programs for the purpose of producing an army of uncritical environmental problem solvers, um, like Timothy Luke, I worry about that, period. Timothy Luke's provocative essay, Eco-Managerialism, Environmental Studies as Power Knowledge Formation, made me question just giving students what they think they want from their degrees. Luke cautions ESS programs against pumping out eco-managerialists who will be hired by government agencies to manage natural resources without critically examining human nature relationships, um, power, and knowledge production. Ultimately, he says, this just supports existing power relations. Following Luke, I don't want students or the program to succumb to market definitions of skills and solutions. But at the same time, I want students to feel that their knowledge has value in the world, and that they might even get paid for that knowledge, and they kind of need to. It's a kind of a fine line to walk, and I feel like this is another one of those contradictions I'm trying to work through. So problem solving isn't the end game, and I try to teach them it's a means to an end. This takes me back to the beginning of the talk. What, are, what future are we desiring? What's that end goal? How do we cultivate desire and imagination and what Adrian Marie Brown calls the practice of misery resistance? Although hope is often seen as helping students to get up in the morning and act, in this last section, I argue against hope and against an uncritical idea of what it means to problem solve. I agree with Norgard that uncritical hope is a kind of denial. Rather, I want students to have a sense of their affective resources for the long haul of critical thinking and purpose. Following Maniates, I believe that ESS programs fail students if they leave them with an emaciated theory of social change and a politics of guilt and crisis that do little to foster the creativity and compassion that sustains personal and collective transformation. And like, I just couldn't say any better, so I had to put his quote there. I designed the ENSD senior, caps, senior capstone course with the student learning outcomes of fostering confidence in their skills, a broad idea of how social change works, and some sense of how they'll join in the efforts, what might be understood as efficacy. So this is a, a new word I'm thinking about a lot. <laughs> what is efficacy? Um, I believe a better alternative to ending on hope is to design an exercise or even a whole curriculum if you have that power that achieves affective resilience through efficacy and a sense of collectivity. So first we become critical of doom and gloom narratives like um, Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth, which I learned at the beginning of their time in our programs is one of the reasons why they came into environmental studies. They, I asked them, was there a text or a movie or a person that made you think this was the major for you, and Al Gore's film comes up a lot, and I'm sure that will change as we get older, but you know, that's currently um, an interesting um, turning point for many students. Alarmism is increasingly regarded as having done more harm than good. Richard Eckersley writes, the sense of the world as threatening and hostile produces a fraying of citizenship and democracy, as well as the vulnerability to the politics of self-interest and fear. This is sounding um, unnervingly familiar, right? 
The dramatic imagery of apocalypse is a dystopian story that actually, quote, hinders the development of particular responses, especially ones that might be gradual rather than urgent. As Greg Girard observes, it polarizes responses, quote, prodding skeptics towards scoffing dismissal and potentially inciting believers to confrontation and potentially even violence. Apocalyptic rhetoric often, quote, fosters a delusive search for culprits and causes. In the classroom, we can combine risk theory, eco-psychology, and close reading methods to ask, what do these narratives make us feel? And how do these feelings affect our ability to act, connect, and empathize? How do these feelings, oh, sorry. And why is it easier for us to imagine apocalypse than it is for us to imagine society moving away from carbon? Um, this is a um, uh, research that Kari Norgard mentions in her recent chronicle piece about the social sciences and why they're important for climate change studies. And she says it, it's evidence that we don't have a sociological imagination that we can't, that, that most Americans can imagine the apocalypse before they can imagine moving beyond fossil fuels. <laughs> that's just like, oh, that's really sad. I think we can do something about that in the class, you know. Um, ESS classes should address the cultural work that apocalyptic rhetoric does to us and teach them to closely analyze rather than get swept up in oversimplified alarmism of crisis. So that's one thing um, I think a humanities classroom can do a, lot, do a lot to help deal with the affect, right? And it's content-based. It's not just having group therapy. Tom Van Doren rejects hope as a, quote, passive abdication, passive abdication that says everything is okay, our consciousness is assuaged, there's no need to think about responsibility, somebody else has it covered. For him, hope eschews reality and becomes self-censorship that serves the status quo. Jeff and Dry Duncan calls, a, calls for a critical hope that gives students new resources <coughs> to deal with the forces that affect their lives and acknowledges that the painful path is the hopeful path. Heather Hauser criticizes the American penchant for positive thinking and counts the problems with green brightness. First, she starts, optimism prevents us from recognizing signs of adversity for which we could prepare. Second, it supports the capitalist mandate to grow at all costs. And third, it obfuscates the crueler aspects of the market economy in favor of a harsh insistence on personal responsibility. Critically examining hope in these ways helps students develop a broad range of alternatives. Rebecca Solnit's work on how social change happens and the evidence of community utopias is crucial at this stage. As students evaluate the personal and collective trauma of doom and gloom narratives and consider how they might personally intervene in social change. In addition to reading widely on affects like hope and despair, um, we broaden our ideas of what counts as social change. We cultivate resilience by seeing social change in the work that we are already doing, as well as in actions that may not have been thought of as valuable because of, social, because of narratives of urgency and myths of individualism. So students often want these clear solutions, right? Like I mentioned earlier in the evaluations, and they want evidence of change happening, and they want to um, have these... Um, my students are really frustrated that we're spending so much time deconstructing and spending time with theory and they want to do action and reconstructing, right? So they're creating constantly these binaries to work against what we're doing in the classroom and, I, and I'm always trying to trouble that with them, including this action stuff, right? As we read Solnit, we ask what counts as social change and how can we measure it? Is activism standing in a picket line protesting something? Is changing someone's mind a form of activism? Is changing your own mind a kind of social change? Is critique a form of love? Is sitting in a classroom reframing environmental problems a crucial step towards solving them? How will we even know that change is happening? Do we even need evidence to be convinced that the work is meaningful? To my impatient millennials, who only see social change happening in spectacles of tidy resolution, Solnit's writing on the slow, messy, collective work of social change is booing. Howard Zinn also writes, oh, sorry, Howard Zinn, here we are Howard Zinn. Howard Zinn also writes, revolutionary change does not come from one cataclysmic moment, beware of such moments, but as an endless succession of surprises, moving zigzag toward a more decent society. We don't have to engage in grand heroic actions to participate in the process of social change. 
So teaching students that change is everywhere and hard to measure, and that spectacular, triumphant moments are only the result of the in invisible work of a lot of faceless idealists is crucial to cultivating resilience. These readings lead students to seek out narratives of social change from sources other than dominant media. So this is another thing we can do in classrooms that's not about group therapy. They can see how part, they're part of a collective effort. It leads them to recognize the power that they already have. Solnit cautions against narratives of powerlessness because they let us off the hook. And I, that's what I feel I, I saw, in addition to being heartbroken by my students' inability to visualize a, a future they can imagine, I also saw themselves coming up with lots of excuses of their powerlessness that felt to me like they were trying to get off the hook. And so I, um, I, I fluctuate between kind of being hard on them about that and also being extremely heartbroken for them. It's also crucial um, for students to see how feelings like desire, joy, wonder, and pleasure can play a role in social change. And I'm thinking here, Adrienne Marie Brown talks about pleasure activism. And when I read that um, in Emergent Strategy, I thought, oh, pleasure activism, sign me up. That sounds good. My students love that book. Um, so if you want to teach a book and bring another book in, you just bring that one in. It's really great. So here we come to appreciate, as Hauser notes, that the arts are not only, quote, giving expression to these affects, but innovatively deploying them. Working through emotional responses, considering and responding to the emotions of others, and conversing and thinking and reflecting, build community and cultivate the imagination. And I contend that this is social change happening as we sit there in the classroom. Students do not need to be field biologists, gathering data, or legislators who can make structural change from the top down. They don't have to wait around for or even become themselves what Solna called that one magical politician who was going to solve all the problems. They can put aside their science envy when they realize that the ways that they can affect the world are limitless. Timothy Morton puts it this way, reframing our world, our problems, and ourselves is part of the ecological project. That is what praxis means, action that is thoughtful and thought that is action, active. Ecological thought, or awareness of connection as Morton defines it, can, as he puts it, call us in from the grief. So the ability to critique existing narratives and create new ones is key to cultivating affective resilience, and it gives students power over information overload and imagining options for political action. It is not our duty to take care of our students' psychic lives. Given the myriad stresses that are impinging upon them, as well as the greater pressures on teachers in this field, and especially on women, to meet students' emotional demands, I'm not arguing that we do more care than we already do. But I think that there are steps we can take to possibly even reduce demands on us while focusing students on how their courses tools help them navigate that turbulence. In syllabi and in everyday um, conversations, here are some SLOs we might think about putting in our curricula in our classes. We can challenge students' assumptions about happiness. We can provide them tools to critically analyze the effects of environmental narratives on their energies. We can broaden their view of what counts as social change. We can detach them from binaries that limit their imaginations and sap their motivation to act. And I, as I mentioned, we can ex expose them to uh, stories and work and oral histories of people who have been doing this work for a long time. I think these are skills. Student learning outcomes we should build into our curriculum and even in our promotional materials. I think they're needed for personal and planetary health. Greater attention to the affective experiences of ESS students will develop the generation of environmental leaders able to absorb this information and still effectively act, or think, for that matter. As we address the increasing diversification of student demographics, the narrative affect, to use Hauser's term, of our curricula is all the more important for showing students how environmental issues are not just out there in the wilderness, they're relevant to all of us. And all students come to our programs with knowledge about these complex human nature relationships. An ESS curriculum should show how nature is part of our daily lives, no matter what, where we came from or whether we grew up camping or not. John Meyer calls this the resonance dilemma, the inability to connect, the inability to connect social justice issues to climate change and dominant environmental politics. If, through affective pedagogy, we can make nature resonate with students' lives and help them be resilient in the face of crisis, we would find ourselves less, not more, in the role of therapists. We can devote class time 
Not office hours or midnight emails. I can't tell you how many of those I've done. Um, I don't have good sleep patterns. Um, I, it's like a discipline for me. Nope, not gonna respond to that crisis right now. Um, we can devote class time and not this um, extracurricular time to processing the affective trajectory that students are gonna inevitably experience in your classroom. This approach is really hard to achieve, and I come talking to you this after all kinds of failures at doing this just this semester and every, all the time, you know. <laughs> it sounds really beautiful, and I can't tell you I'm achieving this all the time. Um, but it would be really useful, even as, as it's very messy, for the purposes of diverse student learning, for climate justice, and for our own self-preservation as loving instructors and as human beings that are groping our own way through the Anthropocene. Thank you. Oh, good. Definitely really resonated with me. Uh, one question I have, I was just wondering um, what kind of exercises, you talked about exercises um, that are kind of alternatives to the ending with hope yeah. model. Yeah. I would love to know, like, an example. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, so I think what the mistake is is that we teach them all the content and then we get rid of whatever was the last thing in the last week and we put Rebecca Solnit's Hope in the Dark in there and we hope that's going to solve it. And I guess what I'm saying is that, um, is that, I'm sorry, did somebody do that? I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about then. It's a thing. It's a thing. Working all of it is also kind of old. But I know yeah. like some of the lines like activism requires a love of contradiction and paradox. Yeah. It's like some beautiful stuff. Yeah, but it's, it's like, beautiful. even as a hopeful ending, it kind of yeah, okay, good. So, I mean, so it doesn't, it's like not even adequate for even as great as it is. Yeah. Oh, okay, I want to hear more about that. Um, I, so alternatives, one of, so one of the things that I'm really eager to do is um, structuralize in the entire class as much as I can these two concepts of efficacy and collectivity. And um, anything that we can do along the way to get them to feel like they have power and they're already doing the work, Great. One of the most amazing um, days in the class, it's like the easiest thing ever, is you ask them to write all of the things that they're going to do for their capstone in a sentence. So like, I want to. And then you put all of these up in bullet points and you go and you read them all. It's so easy. It's a kind of way of impact mapping. So an impact map exercise would be an answer to that. Um, there's different, you can just Google impact mapping and do triangles or circles or bubbles or whatever. I do bullet points because I'm not a very visual person, I confess. So um, I just ha read off all of these sentences of 36 students in the classroom and I ask, how does that make you all feel? And everybody's just like full up. They're just so happy that all of these people are going to go out in the world and do these things. And so that's why I have this kind of rhythmatic thing up here because that's my visual of understanding how a change is happening. And, I, and I, I try to reflect the mirror back on them that the change is already happening with what they're doing. And um, that's, you know, that's, and this here is, a, I, I don't know if any of you guys have read Derek Jansen, it kind of goes around on Facebook every now and then, this one on Beyond Hope, and it's really polemical, and students actually don't like this essay, which is interesting to me, because I love it, um, but one of the things that Derek Jensen says, and this is kind of an answer to your question, too, is, um, you know, this, this narrative that we don't have any power in the face of the problem is, as Solna says, gets us off the hook from doing anything. And then if we think about green lifestyle changes as the only way to do anything, that really limits our imagination of our power. And so we spend time in the classroom trying to broaden our imagination of what, what power we do have and uh, stop worrying about hope, you know, start just doing the work. Um, so, and then if, you, if students imagine themselves as part of a collectivity, so that's the efficacy point, but the, the collectivity point is that they see themselves as part of this larger force that's been going on, you know, historically. They see themselves sort of part of a genealogy of, of people who've been doing this, which is why I like that those essays by um, people who've done social activist essays, which is something I never cared about before. Um, but boy, the students love it. Um, you know, like uh, Paul Hawken, the Blessed Unrest uh, book, he has a short piece in that book I talked, that I wrote, they showed the um, impossible will take a while. That is, you know, the earth is, you know, the earth is hiring and they need you or something. And the students just eat these up and they're just short, short essays um, to make students realize that they have efficacy and that there is a movement of people doing this stuff and have been doing this stuff. And so that's where getting away from dominant media is helpful too. 
you know, ask students to find stories of positive change happening. Ironically, the notion that terrible things, the doom and gloom stuff was supposed to get people to act. But in fact, I think, and I, I'm, I'm sure people who, who, who even spend more time thinking about narrative than I do could, could even speak to this more, but it seems to me in the classroom that narratives about all the great things that are happening actually get students to feel like they can get up more in the morning and do that work. So that's the collectivity piece. Um, so however you feel that you can do that um, in creative ways, you know, and again, it's not, doesn't mean we have a group therapy session. I mean, I, I don't want I, I to sit around and talk about how we feel all day long. That is not what I'm suggesting. <laughs> I mean, it really does sap my energy to do that. And I'm trying to figure out how to not do that. But I'd love to hear other examples to answer your question, too. Yeah. Great talk. Oh, thanks. One, uh, what, one question that's been really challenging me in my teaching recently, and, um, and, and I wonder if you could just reflect on it for me. <laughs> Um, and maybe a little others too, I don't know. Um, but one of the things that comes up, I teach a class on development, you know, the developing world. You know, uh -huh. and needless to say, I so resonate with the arc. <laughs> I mean, I really see it. In this and my, my, the friend who I was with at Evergreen said that development was the word that, oh, yeah. that took the rug out from underneath her. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So that's it, so it's every day that I teach in this class, it's like, it's, it's just amazing. Yes. Yeah. Like this. Right. One of the questions yeah. I have is, God. and I lob this at my students on a pretty regular basis, um, uh, is I say that we we really, because of the ecological and climate um, challenges that we are facing, we really do not have the luxury of slow incremental change anymore. Uh, the, are you are going to say is, that? This is a reality that <laughs> no. just eats at me. Every yeah. Day okay. Every True. Doing, uh, and, and I do historical <laughs> geography, so it's even rougher. Yeah. Than that, so um, and, and so I wonder if, like, you know, because one of the things we do in the class is we work toward, at the end, talking about the contestations and the, and the possibilities of pushing against the sort of developmentalisms of, you know, and, and this kind of thing. Um, and I want to, I want to just ask you, like, how do you deal with the temporality? Oh you know, gosh. Like, what are some of the I am really, yeah. I don't know. I think that, that you really, you've picked up on something I haven't really resolved. I don't know what it is, Well, I, I think the urgency plus inability trap is really problematic, and I don't like that. I know I don't like that. And I know that um, in, in the talk I gave yesterday, I was talking about risk perception. And I think um, the problem with being in the triage room all the time is that it gets us off the hook from thinking. And I want students to slow down and think, and I want them to do that in the seat, in the classroom, you know, and then, and I also want them to, and I, so I argue, and I don't know if the answer to the question, but I argue, you cannot go out and solve problems unless you really think about what the problem is. Yeah. And so, you know, many of students wanted to go to Standing Rock last year, a year ago, and I, that's fine, and I said, okay, let's, let's redesign your final assignment so that you can do that and it won't affect your, that's, I'm happy to promote student activism as part of the curriculum, that's one awesome thing you can do, but what ends up happening is that some students have this conversation with themselves and think, well, that's a lot of energy, that's fraught with a lot of um, identity politics baggage, and I'm, I'm, I don't want to be the white savior industrial complex person, and so what I mean, it really raises great questions about positionality that I want them to not just run out urgently and run off to, you know, Standing Rock. I want them to think about all these things and then figure out where they're going to put that energy because that's a lot of energy and money and stuff to do that. So I think the middle ground answer is like, okay, spend enough time thinking about where you're going to put your energies, but then stop the thinking and go and do the thing you, that you've now decided and commit to it, right? Because you can sit in the classroom forever and ever and ever and say, I can't act on anything because I really don't know if I think the right thing about this yet. And so there comes that moment where you have to kind of say, okay, I've thought about enough, I'm going to go do it. But, I, but, I, but students are so on that other end of that spectrum that I, I feel like I'm just bringing them I'm bringing them to the longer temporal time frame, and they have these insights like, oh, well, Rob Nixon says slow violence, and so slow change is also a thing. And it's like a great insight. But you're right, at some point it's like, well, actually slow change is, we need more than that, you know? I mean, we do. But I, I don't want to inhibit them from, do, from thinking and 
critical thinking before they do that stuff. Um, so that there is, that's a harder argument to get them to buy, right? That the right. thinking is important. Yeah. It's easy for them to think action is like, they're ready to go. My students anyway. I don't know. What do you think the answer to that? What do you do with temporality? Well, one of the, one of the things that we've been talking about, it's been really fruitful, is, is this idea that when I say slow incremental change, they automatically think policy. <laughs> you know, they, they think about how, just how ridiculous, you know, some of our environmental laws are, you know, yeah. how long they took to just get passed and still be so far from where the rest, so much of the rest of the world is, right? You know, so they feel very powerless in terms of like, that yeah, kind of stuff, yeah, you know? sure. But then, we, but then when we read things like Anna Whitman's work and, you know, and Raj Patal talking about, you know, this, this slum uh, shack dwellers movement and the, yeah. and the pavement dwellers <clears throat> and, you know, and things like this that we, we talk about and they start to say, okay, well, and ultimately that seems to be the answer is they have to, you know, at some yeah. point you just got to, you know, okay, let's, let's accept the fact that the challenge is, you know, insane. Yeah. But you got to go somewhere. You got to go somewhere. Yeah. Right? We have to do something. Yeah. So the point is learn learn the material like you're saying learn yeah. the history and then get to work. Yeah, and I think I think quote, you know? Yeah, I mean I love that quote. Um I I I agonize over this, right? I'm like I got to get it all ni neatly tied in a package existentially solved. It all has to work out perfectly to for them to know how to feel good about whatever action they're going to take. And I, I had a conversation with someone who said, you know, Sarah, all you got to do is explain how the tools that you can offer, the limited tools, you're not going to reverse the election in the classroom. You're not going to save the planet in the classroom. You've got these limited tools that you have training in, and your job is to explain how that might be useful as one thing they can use in whatever they want to do. And so instead of saying, like, oh, here's the answer to all your problems, I'm, I think of myself as just like, okay, I'm giving you this one thing I'm good at. All right. You have to figure it out. You know? <laughs> it's really hard to draw that boundary because I want to I wanna fix it all for them, you know. Yeah, sorry. Okay, okay. Yeah, Sarah. I think, um, I, I, I guess some of this has made me think of, um, Freyra and like the banking concept and like is there a degree where yeah. like to what degree are students seen as like empty and not getting it and like yeah. we need to dump all this stuff into them so that they do get it. Mm -hmm. Like or to what degree are students in classes seen as like your experiences mm -hmm. like I'm gonna learn as a teacher, I'm gonna learn from you. As yeah. a student you're a teacher, as a teacher I'm like we have student <laughs> teacher, teacher students and all yeah. that. Is that yeah. I wonder what how does that how might that be at play? It's, it, I, pedagogy? it's uh, absolutely at play. I mean, the very fact that um, the very the very fact that this is my new topic is them teaching me, right? Um, I've changed everything, and I'm thinking I got to go and find. I got to use the tools that I have, which is like research stuff, and maybe maybe answer their call for what they're asking for in the classroom. Um, and also, it's asking to, to think less about content outcomes and more about affective outcomes. And I, the students, my students, have asked, are asking that from the classes. So in that sense, I think of that as not a banking model. Um, however, now that I have all these new resources, I come in with all these new resources, right? And, and we do have assignments, you know? So that the structure of class is quite similar. It's just that they're now they're reading Emergent Strategy, and I've taken two weeks out of the class to do an Emergent Strategy facilitation process instead of teaching, which I never did that before, and I'm not a facilitator, so I, it was very awkward for me. Um, but if you really took that to the lengths that, that the kind of facilitation, the, it's, it's a, um, vision change, a vision action change um, model. And you would do that at the beginning of the class, the students would totally come up with their change plan, and you would change the entire, you would, do, you would develop an entire syllabus out of what they came up with. And then they would, they would spend the rest of the class figuring out how to implement the changes that they came up with in that beginning process. That would be really cool. I just haven't had the courage to do that yet. But that, when I read it, I, and I had a conversation with the people I was reading with, I said, this is pedagogy. And they said, yeah. And they said, well, if this was really pedagogy, you would do it in week one, you'd have no syllabus, and the students would run, do the rest, you know? And I thought, okay, I'll think about that. <laughs> but, but that's one way to really go that direction. Yeah. So the first thing, just 
just in terms of like ways that we get around this. Yeah. Uh, something that I've actually found works pretty well with my students. The very first day being like, if you want answers or solutions, or like, uh, don't come to a humanities class. Like, I'm not giving <laughs> you answers. You're out of luck if that's what you want. What we are going to provide are these ways of seeing, these tools, these ways of thinking. Right? I liken it to the the they live classes, right? <laughs> so talk about, like, I'm, I'm, I'm ruined not just like in the environment for them. I ruin literature for them, right? Because every the time they read, all they can do is predict. Yeah. It. But that's yeah. actually the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. And what I do is I let them know that like you take that with you, right? You get to keep the glasses. You can have that way of seeing no matter where you go or what you do. And that actually, I think, does give them a little something beyond just like, oh, man, everything sucks. Yeah. Um, and also, also there. Because like, you still see everything that is awful, but you have your way with you. Sorry. I just, I, I provoke them um, in that wonderful history, uh, in the history of hope that, that um, Bristow, and I, I think I mentioned a couple of folks in there had published in, in uh, Environmental Humanities, the Ben Doran um, piece. They talk about critique as a form of care. And I think Timothy Warren talks about this a lot, too. And, and students think that you, if you criticize wilderness, or if you criticize the idea of nature, you criticize literature, that somehow that means you don't love it anymore. You can't take pleasure in it anymore. And so that, yeah, those binaries, we want them to move beyond, yeah. And that's an affective thing. They want, you want them to have pleasure, and you want to have their pleasure through the critique, you know, ideally. Oh, sorry. I wanted to you think about that. Yeah. I found that the other thing that often happens, the next step that I'm not as good at thinking about, I was curious if you encountered this, is students be like, oh, okay, we're, we're trying to critique social structures and stuff like that. All we got to do is like, so let's just end capitalism, right? Yeah, right, 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 yeah. We need to step outside of that, right? And I was curious how you dealt with this sort of inside the yeah. system, outside the yeah. system stuff. Yeah, that yeah that's so that's cool. A thing you encounter. Mm -hmm. Your Absolutely, because of course the scale of everything. When, once they start to see all the structural stuff within the classes, they're like, "We got to break down capitalism," and that's not going to happen, right? Like, I mean, I mean, it might happen. I'm not going to say it's not going to happen, but like they are thinking to themselves, "I can't single-handedly do that today," you know, and and that causes that level, that kind of inability trap thing, and um, so inevitably. You sort of say to them, well, also, you might want to have a job after college, and, and dollars come from capitalism right now. So um, I am in an existing institution that's paid for by tax dollars, and there are all kinds of ideologies that come with those tax dollars that I might disagree with. And then I just, you know, do all my little work, my little elbowing around with it, you know? And you've got to do the same thing. And so I, I, kind of, I kind of say, that's just an excuse to not start working now, again. Right, um, and so the incremental change question then comes back in, right? Okay, but we don't have an option. I don't feel like I have an option. I mean, I, I'm kind of Pollyanna that way. Like, what am I going to do? Not get up in the morning and do this? Anyway, but that's a great one, and students think about it a lot, and they think about it in the other classes too, like the politics classes, because we we have four classes in environmental studies that I teach, and then the curriculum is classes from all over the campus. And so in all these other classes, econ or poli sci or whatever, they're getting all of this other stuff, structural analysis, and good. I don't want to teach all of that, you know? <laughs> but they think about that there. Yeah. Yeah? I have a question about the formula at the end, the efficacy plus collectivity equals resilience. Yeah. Um, it's, it looks really simple and elegant, doesn't it? Yeah. It is really elegant. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> mostly my question is about the resilience part versus mm. some of the other terms you brought up justice or the planetary salvation, um, which seems like they could also go in the same space. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm curious, what, mm -hmm. what are the limits of resilience as kind of an end goal, and then yeah. why, do you, why do you have the less choose in spite of yeah. Actually, it's so funny. Jason and I were just talking before the talk. I was like, I don't really like resilience, but somehow this has come up all the time. Um, so I have often poo-pooed the term resilience because I think of it as an excuse for business as usual, right? That if we, if we're resilient, then we can just carry on and after all we'll recover, right? So I, I never globbed onto it and I, and I never thought about it in terms of, um, I always thought about it in terms of like infrastructure or, bio, or ecosystem resilience. I haven't thought about it in terms of emotional or cultural resilience, which is increasingly 
whole programs are developing around those words, you know? And I'm nervous about it, so I hear you. Um, and I would like to hear more from you about that. Um, but what's frustrating to me with students is a sense that they can't navigate difficulty. Or it seems to me that they don't want, that, they, that they're averse to um, challenges and difficulty. Mine are. And um, I think that that's why I've, I've come up, I feel like resilience is better than hope. Because the ending on hope thing wasn't working and I kept thinking this isn't really right. And so resilience seemed like the next best thing, but I'm not sure I'm s happy with it. Yeah. But it has something to do with dealing with difficulty and still acting effectively in, a, in amidst a lot of negative affects. Um, salvation, yeah, I was, uh, somebody yesterday was saying, have you, talked to, have you thought about um, more religious terms? And I hadn't, you know, I really hadn't. Um, even with a religious studies background. I'm sort of loath to go there, right? Um, but many students do, and I think that's great. If that's, if that's their inclination, I'm happy. I'm, this is not a prescriptive teleological thing. It just feels like I gotta figure out how to design classes with some way that before they walk across the stage um, and continue to work on all these things, it's not hokey or empty or something and maybe resilience is hokey and empty but <laughs> it feels better to me than hope yeah I don't know. it's a good critique though so i for like the whole talk i've been sitting here asking myself whether interest is an affect hmm uh, like like being interested in things yeah. because wonder and wonder is yeah well but wonder is like wonder clearly is Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. and the reason that I was saying interest is because that's the thing that I always offer my students instead of hope, or at least that, that I tell them. Uh. So like, like, I'm not going to tell you how to solve these problems. I'll make and them I'm interesting. I'm not going to end on a, on a kind of positive note. Yeah, um, I'm going to try to make them interesting. Yeah, and that's that's going to be my my goal. And huh. I, but and I and I don't. I guess I don't know. Like, is because the way that I, that has off, that I've often thought about that is a sort of a detachment. Exactly, that's what was know, my that, first that thought, yeah. It's not really affective, except it can be, right? If you're interested, I mean, I think that for me, it is. Like, you know, I find the Anthropocene interesting, mm -hmm. uh, and that that is kind of an antidote to despair. So I can get yeah. excited about reading about something that's actually objectively horrible. <laughs> um, that's why I, I'm sort of sorry I laughed, I laughed at the child, right? Like, <laughs> <was> crying. <laughs> Um, well, I have to hold, like a whole separate question about that. <laughs> Sorry. I have been that kid, like, but, but from reverse, yeah. like I had my, when my daughter, this was a couple of years ago, so my daughter was like four, three maybe, you know, and on Earth Day, like her preschool class went out to, and like did an Earth Day activity, like picking litter. She comes home, she's like, we cleaned up the Earth today. And I was like, good check. started weeping. Oh. Because I was just like, oh. was so genuine mm -hmm. and I was like you have no idea <laughs> like, you know and I was I mean, so I was, it was very like, moving it was like yeah. the opposite of that yeah uh, I've been I'm there not usually <laughs> the way that I kind of like, I'm not usually that kid um, because I'm usually like interested and so yeah. that's what I'm, I'm, I guess yeah. I'm trying to kind of I'll think about it I, I it sounds like it is to you it sounds like I you are using it that way yeah is but yeah. that I had been actually thinking about it more in a kind of um, that kind of detachment, the way that yeah. one might go into sort of triage learning, so that you don't. Yeah. I mean, you're thinking, but that you're not. Mm -hmm. um, you're not really feeling about the. Yeah, um, I love it. And I, I actually, in the description of the triage where I said, let's not get swept up in the doom and gloom, let's think about them critically, it kind of asks the same, for the same move, to move away from emotion and into some sort of reason, right, again. And, and that's, that you could argue that's not affect. Um, I, you know, affect to me is not the end goal and the whole purpose. For me, it's the end goal of getting students to be able to get up in the morning, come to class, and then graduate and go on and do this work. Um, 
So if that is an intellectual process for many students, great. If that's an emotional process for many students, great. For me, it would be an intellectual process, I think. I'm a very heady person. I, uh, I know that emotions are happening somewhere, but I, that usually my reason kind of circumvents any acknowledgement of it, you know? Um, except for the fact that I found myself drowning in this stuff and, you know, um, I then realized I was having an emotional reaction to this, you know. But um, I don't really, I don't know, I don't have the answer for that, but I also think it doesn't so much matter. If it's not an affect, it's not an affect, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Whether it's an affect or not is not important. That broadly, this is so important, right? I mean, like, I, you know, I taught last year, day after the election, oh, right? We, do, were, we, we all remember that read, day, uh, yeah. The Royce Granton book when he died in the proceedings. Oh. We're halfway through Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower. Perfect. So this is, so you're doing exactly what I'm saying here, right? Yes, yes. And, you know, my students were weeping. Yeah. Uh, I was. I couldn't teach that day because I was spending too much time. I, mean, I was I, yeah, having an effective day. I said some things <laughs> then in the class early. Yeah. Um, and I was very pleased actually to see one of my students who had been sort of visibly upset then like at the protest that I passed on the way walking back mm. to put over and like seeming better. So I was like, okay, that's good. She's like, um, she's doing something, better. yeah. Um, just a sign. But the other thing that I wanted to, so the book that I like to end with that's worked best with, um, is Animals People. The, the novel Animals People. Yeah. And the reason yeah. is because it's such a good book. Wow. It's a phenomenal, and it's not a happy book. Um, but it's an amazing, it's just a good novel. So that it's, huh. it's a type of book. Yeah, yeah. Ball, and, um, yeah, 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 so, yeah, yeah. Um, no, it, but it's it's phenomenal. Yes, um, yes. And it's, it's simply so good, and the students really resonate with it on that level. And yeah. so that I feel like I can kind of end in a way that I'm happy with. <laughs> like, I'm okay with, because it's yeah. like I didn't let it be yeah. easy, yeah. but we also didn't really end in a space of total like... Despair. Despair. Yeah. Partly just because there's either, it's either interesting or there's this kind of yeah. like aesthetic recompense, which is maybe really problematic, but nonetheless. Yeah, yeah, I, I'd be interested. I, we, you, you make me want to know what other, what other people do to do this work, I mean, to get around these problems. That's one of the solutions that you've come up with that seems to work for you. And um, for me, I'm like, I have, I feel so daunted by, but also privileged to be able to see a whole curriculum and think, okay, from, for, from day one to the end, how does it all come together? And that's an arc that's much bigger than a cor course. And um, that's really fun. Um, but I'm sure at the course level, um, people have end endpoints. So, I mean, it, we see our syllabi as stories, right, that we're asking students to go through. And so I'm curious what other people do for this problem besides just soul it at the end, which is an awesome way to do it. It's better than nothing, right? Um, but um, I just, I, 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 it's caused me to research a bunch of other fields that I didn't, I was not trained to do. Um, Social movement theory and psychology and pedagogy and uh, yeah. Um, one thing I always tell them, which I, I feel a little complicated about, but I, you know they're struggling. I totally resonate with your whole talk. Yes, this is, and I went to Humboldt State, so. Oh really? Yeah, for my undergrad. So. Oh my gosh. Go Jacks. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Yay! That's so cool. I, uh, so when I tell them. You know, they're having these problems, and I say, well, yeah, if you're feeling uncomfortable and you don't have answers and you're doing it right. Yeah, so you're right great. Now because this, is, this is what it is to be an activist, and this is what it is to be yes. thinking about these problems. There yes. is no, so you're, you're yeah. doing it. Yes. This is success. You know? Yeah, yes, um, yes, yes. Yeah. And at the same time, I feel a little uncomfortable about it sometimes because of um, that feels like, uh, like a privileged thing to say also. Like, you know you're struggling, you're doing it right, because like a lot of people struggle differently and some yeah. people struggle more than others, and mm -hmm. so to just blanket say the struggle is the thing feels mm -hmm. like kind of imperfect. Well, yeah, I, I would, so I would think right. that you wouldn't say the same thing to every student, right? Yeah. That every student's at a different stage at yeah. this, and so you respond to particular students who are ex exhibiting very particular <laughs> set of worries in that way. Um, 
so um, one of the things that happened um, that really knocked me around last semester and it made me think about um, how I, I really made me think differently about this research because um, a white male student had kind of a meltdown in class and he basically said that the whole thing was a waste and that everything was a failure and that none of us were actually learning anything or doing anything to do anything and I had co-taught a climate change class with a physical geographer the semester before and he said that was a total failure and it was just like he was just taking all of the stuff and he, and I thought I, I was like trying really hard to not myself cry right I was like oh my gosh and um, and it was, it, was, it was one of those moments where his crisis was taking up all the space. And I realized at that moment, and then also a student gave a talk this semester about white fragility, and she was like, even talking about how hard this stuff is, is kind of this like centering whiteness. And I thought, holy shit, I'm doing anything wrong, <laughs> you know? And so I had to, I, I do think that, the, that these arguments are very much coming from my perspective positionality of privilege and whiteness and gender too and that I am always a little nervous about it right and so yesterday the friend who brought me to Evergreen um, she is Nepalese and she said I don't ever even think about this stuff I will not even go there if I even open the door to entertaining my students emotions around this stuff forget about it I will become um, an um, I will become a symbol of what it is they're expecting from me. And I said, holy cow, I gotta just throw out the whole research. I don't wanna do this anymore, you know? But, there's, but I think that if, as long as everybody's taking all that into account, and as long as I'm not saying there's this one arc, and it goes from idealism to this to that and there, because um, another student came, I did a round table on this topic with one student on it at the ASLI conference last, um, last June in Detroit. And six of us talked about how we deal with emotion in the classroom. And then the student, one of my students came and gave her a talk and she basically said, I didn't, I wasn't suffering the same way. I come from a family that's been doing the suffering from my family, a mixed race, I've got all this stuff going on and it pisses me off that we take so much time trying to baby these people through it. And I was like, I didn't know you felt this way. <laughs> Holy cow. And so I, it was just this moment, and it was beautiful. It was awesome. But it taught, again, it taught me more about how I need to really constantly think about this, this theory. And um, I think it's just like uh, you're do, you, the struggle is real, and you're doing it right. I don't know. I don't, I'm not, don't actually mean to say that to you, <laughs> but <laughs> it's a joke. I resonate with everything you said. Yeah. I'm, still I'm working on it. I don't have it right. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, even last night, I thought, God, I'm going to give this talk tomorrow. And I just had this doubt about it. And I don't know. So. Yeah, but that is the thing, right? I mean, you don't have the clear picture either. And that's partly your yeah. point. So like, yeah. what you did, you were like, and forward march in this clear way. Yes, so yes. Kind of disingenuous. So. Right. But at the same time, I don't want to sit there with the white students in their guilt and let them hang out there. And then what ends up happening, and I had a student this semester, I mean, he's a senior, and he basically said, I am everything that you teach in the class is evil. I can't stay in this major anymore. And I was like, oh, that's not the point at all. You know, like, that, like it, I, I have failed, you know, major failure. So somehow along this journey, we, we didn't get him, you know, <laughs> so it, um, it, it fails some people, you know. Hmm? I've, I felt really awful about that because the, 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 the kind of point I made in the paper about collecting many white students around their guilt towards something like solidarity or something. Um, I, I, and I, I, I'm, I'm, with, I, I'm, I'm with many frontline communities and saying allyship is not the end goal, so I'm using different words. But that, that's, um, that, that usually is what seems to happen. There's this kind of collective community building and they figure out their own terms of it. And it, it, seems, it seems awesome except for these moments that come up and I'm like, something is really not going right here. So I puzzle over it, yeah. But to uniformly expect that everyone's going through the same thing was the first mistake I made, yeah, yeah. There is a reception waiting. Yeah, yeah. Hey. Hey, thank you for sharing me with your stories.